Okay, good morning and thank you very much for coming. So, as we just heard, I am Sam from Munich. My PhD supervisor is Professor Claudia Plant now at the University of Vienna. So, just uh, let me map a little trajectory here about what I'll be talking about. I'll start with a definition of the problem because obviously clustering is not a rigorously defined problem. We'll have a look at the sort of data uh, on which we're focusing. We'll then uh, have a look at how uh, existing approaches fare on that sort of problem, on that sort of data, and sort of highlight some of the recurring issues that those approaches have on the sort of data on which we're focusing. We'll then spend most of the time in this presentation on our approach and how that works exactly. We'll then see uh, how that approach or how our technique skinny dip fares on the problems and on the data in which we're interested. And finally, uh, we'll discuss, of course, the all-important limitations as well as uh, some interesting strengths of our algorithm to finish up. So let's dive straight in. What kind of clustering are we doing? In a sentence, how do we extract clusters from data with extreme global noise? So what, what do I mean by extreme? Here's an example of a synthetic 2D data set. Here we can see the cluster structure is quite clear, distinct. We have six different shaped clusters here. So we're interested in the case where we have perhaps 20, 40, 60, 80, maybe up to 90% global clutter coming from some sort of uh, global clutter or noise distribution. Uh, so we find motivations for this sort of data. We see this sort of data in some fields like astronomy, clustering galaxies, maybe detecting minefields from aerial images. Uh, so we discuss some motivations in our paper a bit further as well. So on this kind of data, how do existing approaches fare? I don't have time to look into all clustering techniques that exist, uh, but we can have a look at a couple of the main paradigms. Let's have a look at centroid-based, for example, uh, and density-based to give us sort of an example, and they highlight some of the key limitations that many of the existing approaches have. So Boring old k means gives us a result like this. We give it uh, k equals 6, which is the correct number of clusters, and it gives us a result that looks like this. One of the takeaways from this is that many centroid-based techniques don't really have a clear concept of what noise is. So we see it's trying to essentially assign every point in the data set to a cluster. Uh, so we find clusters here being composed purely of noise points, which is not particularly useful. So that's one key limitation we, we see sort of recurring in many clustering approaches. Uh, Density-based approaches are an improvement because at least now we have a, a concept of noise, right? This is a, a, the DB scan uh, technique. It's very popular, very, uh, very great technique. Um, but we see uh, some limitations when, we're, when it's faced by overwhelming noise. Uh, so because it's a local technique, we find it starts spawning clusters in the noise region uh, so it's not actually possible to fine-tune the DB scan parameters here such that our three Gaussians aren't merged here, such that our long, thin rectangular cluster isn't fragmented, and such that we're not spawning clusters uh, in our noise regions. So even density-based techniques uh, are struggling. So what do we propose? Skinny dip. So in addition to being a nice marketing name, uh, there is some sense to this name. Uh, so we're skinny in the sense that uh, we rely on few assumptions. We have relatively few, or we have no obscure parameters that we need to give the algorithm. And skinny in the sense of efficient, agile. So uh, we have quite uh, competitive runtime complexity. Uh, so what sort of result does skinny dip give us? Uh, so this is the result that Skinny Dip gives us. It's able to extract the six clusters and able to uh, essentially assign the re remaining points to a noise bucket, which is much more in tune uh, with the kind of uh, result we're looking for. So how does it work? Uh, so the key is in the second part of the name, Dip. So we're using what's called Hartigan's Dip Test. This is a contribution from uh, Hartigan and Hartigan. It's a few years old now, but it's a formal statistical test for measuring the multimodality of a continuous univariate sample, and I'll explain this in detail. Now, that's not a clustering technique. That's a binary hypothesis test. But it has some really interesting and attractive properties that motivated us to build a clustering technique out of it. So we build our stack on top of it. So we have UniDip then, which extends it to be a univariate clustering technique. SkinnyDip, which takes the next step 
to be a multivariate clustering technique. And finally, if we have very high dimensional data, uh, we, we use then and introduce and propose a, a sparse dip, which is a, a search technique for high dimensional data. And the idea is that we're trying to find an optimally multimodal subspace, kind of like what PCA does, but we're not trying to find directions of maximum variance. We're trying to find directions of maximum multimodality because we argue that those sorts of directions are quite interesting from a clustering perspective. So let's start at the bottom of the stack and work our way up. I can't look at all the details of the dip. That would take too long, but I can give you a crash course because we do need to know something about this to, to understand the rest of our contributions. So let's look at Statistics 101. We have a histogram here of a Gaussian sample. Uh, and when there's some extra noise added to it as well. We do not work with histograms. Uh, so we have no concept of bin widths we need to worry about. But I'm just showing this for a visual complement. What we do work with is ECDF, so empirical cumulative distribution functions. Now, this example is unimodal. We have one peak here. So this is sort of the unimodal, common unimodal concept for a continuous sample. Uh, and importantly, the ECDF down the bottom has a signature form in this sort of case. It's convex, then concave. So you see it starts off with a convex form, and then at some point it turns into a concave form. So that's a unimodal distribution. Uh, that's the signature form. So if that's unimodal, what does multimodal look like? Here's a bimodal Gaussian mixture. Uh, and you can see that the ECDF down the bottom now has broken those violations uh, of the, sorry, violated those assumptions of convex, then concave. It's now a much more complex uh, ECDF. So just a quick video now, see how that ECDF changes as we move from multimodal to sing, uh, unimodal, and we see how those, and the form of the ECDF changes. So what the dip is trying to do is decide between these two extremes. Is it a unimodal distribution or is it a multimodal distribution? And it's a binary hypothesis test. So how does it do that? It takes our observed ECDF and tries to fit a unimodal ECDF to it. And we know that a unimodal ECDF has a convex form, red, optionally straight section, blue, and a concave section, green. And then essentially it tries to minimize that maximum difference. And that's a measure for the departure from unimodality. How does it do that? It assigns a primary modal interval, which is that section of maximum slope. We can sort of consider that as our primary cluster. And then it tries to minimize this dip statistic D, which essentially uh, makes the tube in which our unimodal fit has to, has to lie within. I like to think of this as like a chicane on a racing track. So if you can imagine you're looking at a racing track from a bird's eye view, our car driver has to drive from the left hand side of the track to the right, and it has to always stay within the track, but it must follow chicane-like steering. That is all at the start, left steering, then right steering. And so the smallest width of the track that allows the car driver to do that while staying within the track is the dip statistic D. So how does this width of the track vary as we move from a unimodal distribution to a multimodal distribution? Here's another video. You can see unimodal, multimodal, unimodal, multimodal. So we can see that the width of the track, this dip statistic D, is a, a measure for the departure from unimodality. So there are a number of reasons to really like this dip test. Um, I won't enumerate them all, you can sort of glance over them, but they're enough to motivate us to, uh, to want to use this as a foundation uh, for a clustering technique. There are, however, two key limitations. As I said, it's just a binary hypothesis test. It's not a clustering technique out of the box. It's only for univariate data, and it'll only give us the location of, of, of one primary modal interval. So we want all of them, and we want it to be multivariate. So now comes our work, UniDip. This is the first step on our goal, uh, on the way to our goal. It's a univariate clustering technique based on the dip. How does it work? Let's have a look at our Gaussian mixture again. So we start by running the dip on the full sample. And the dip will give us 
one of the modes and say this is your primary mode, uh, but that's obviously not good enough. We want to know where all of them are. So now we have a bit of algorithm design, a bit of recursive heuristics. We start by looking to the right and we include that first mode that we had. The reason for that is now when the dip says that it's unimodal, because we've already included the first mode, we know that there must be then nothing more of interest to the right essentially. So we don't need to worry about looking further to the right. So we look to the left. Now the result is multimodal. Again, we've included our original mode, so now we know there must be something interesting happening to the left. So we recurse into the left-hand side. Running the dip again will give us now the uh, primary modal interval, which is the second mode we're looking for. And we continue in this way in a recursive manner, uh, and it finds essentially all of the modal intervals of a, uh, an arbitrary um, uni, univariate sample. So here we have 17, it's a bit busier, 17 uh, modes in a sea of 75% noise. They're a mixture of Gaussians and uniform peaks. That's univariate. Now we extend to the multivariate case. This is our running example again. So we start by projecting our data univariate projection onto the horizontal axis or the first axis. Here's just the density overlay that I've put in green here. Uh, so we don't use any density estimation at all, it's just for your visual complement. But basically we can see that we have five modes corresponding to the, the projections of these dense areas. Now if we run UniDip on that it will find those five modes and here's one of them that I've highlighted in green here. Obviously we can't call that entire tube a cluster, that would be quite useless. Uh, so we recurse then into the second dimension, applying UniDip again, and that helps to hedge, to bound our clusters dimension by dimension. And so this is a small limitation, we bound them using sort of hyper rectangles essentially. So we can't exactly model rounded patterns, we have these hyper rectangles that bound our clusters. So this is uh, the result that you get then by recursing into each mode that you find along the way. Highlights of this kind of approach, highly robust to global noise, clutter and outliers, so we inherit this robustness from the dip. No multivariate distance computations. Interesting. Uh, so we'll come back to that. Uh, no strict model assumptions. Uh, parameter free, so there are no obscure parameters. The only thing that could be considered a parameter maybe is this statistical significance threshold. The alpha 0 0.05 is what we always use in our work. Uh, deterministic, runtime grows linearly with the data size in practice, uh, so that's important for the whole big data um, yeah, scalability thing. The final layer of our stack is sparse dip. It is a search technique that helps us to find a maximally multimodal subspace in our data space. We argue that pursuing the directions that are mo maximally multimodal is quite an intuitive thing to do from a clustering perspective because those directions are ess essentially separating our data the most, more so than, for example, searching for directions of maximum variance. So here's a, another video that I'll show. This is a real-world data set uh, from one of the R repositories. Uh, if I take the horizontal projection of this data, uh, onto the horizontal axis, I get a projection density that looks something like this, so it's quite boring. Uh, it's not multimodal, but if I rotate it, at some point, and it's coming around now, you'll see a bimodal come up. There it was, and that corresponds to a maximum on our dip surface. So that dip is the width of the road I was talking about earlier, and we want to find maximal values of that, because that corresponds to maximum modality, sorry, maximum multimodality. Uh, so essentially what our search technique does, I don't have time to go into the details, but we search for a, an orthogonal subspace uh, that maximizes the multimodality in this way and we then cluster in that subspace. So that's good if the clustering sort of arbitrarily oriented or if we have many dimensions that are irrelevant to the clusterings in our data set. So that's our approach. How does it fare? Uh, so we have a, a f obviously many experiments in our uh, paper. I'll just quickly go over some real-world data and also uh, some synthetic data. 
runtime is looking very good for us. Uh, I've just omitted it from this presentation because uh, we don't have uh, too much time. But we can have a look at the real world data. Uh, this is a copy and paste of the table from our paper. And we have various real world data sets, 10 of them here, a bunch of comparison techniques from different paradigms we wanted to compare to. And we're looking pretty good. We're ranking number one on uh, seven out of 10 of these and ranking number two on two of the others. This is one of the synthetic plots. Uh, so this shows that as we're ramping up the noise percentage in that running example, we're able to stand our ground. We're able to sort of uh, defend ourselves against this barrage of noise, uh, whereas many of the other techniques sort of t start to break down once the uh, amount of noise becomes overwhelming. Okay, uh, so that sounds interesting, but what are the limitations? And of course there are some, uh, and we need to understand what they are. The hope is that this sort of new, we sort of hesitantly say that this is kind of a new paradigm. We don't fit this, we can't really classify this technique as a, as a centroid-based technique, a spectral technique, a model-based technique, or a, or a density-based technique. It's sort of a, a different beast. Um, so maybe the community would be interested in this paradigm and trying to pursue it and see how far we can get. Uh, to do that, we have to consider some limitations. So there is going to be some information loss through univariate projections. That's quite clear. Uh, if we can construct examples where, uh, where we crit lose critical information as part of this uh, univariate projections. Uh, Permuting the features of the data set may give us different results. So we're dependent on the order in which we process the dimensions. You might have noticed that earlier. Finally, our modal hyper rectangles can't precisely model rounded patterns. And we saw that earlier with those sort of squares I was chopping out. That said, there are some interesting uh, strengths of this approach. Uh, one of them, um, and is that we don't ever need to compute a multivariate distance uh, computation, um, which uh, you know, we say this very hesitantly because there are so many clustering techniques out there, but uh, we're not aware of too many other clustering techniques that don't at some point depend on a Euclidean distance assumption or a Gaussian kernel or something like this. Uh, parameter free, uh, again, no obscure parameters, uh, practically linear runtime complexity, and no strict model assumptions, no convergence-based processes. So the dip is non-parametric in the sense that it just makes this relatively weak assumption of what a modal mode is. It just has this convex, then concave uh, form. So we could use betas. We could use uniform peaks. Uh, it's not necessarily a Gaussian. Uh, so taken together, and again, we say this quite hesitantly, but we're not aware of another clustering technique that has this combination of properties. So I was going to invite you all to, to the bay to have a skinny dip, uh, but I realized that um, it's actually colder here than I expected it to be. <laughs> so um, we'll have to postpone that to Halifax. Uh, but um, yeah, thanks. Uh, great presentation, thank you. Um, could you go into a little bit of the Nonlinear runtime components of the algorithm? Yeah, so it's um, super linear in the number of clusters that it eventually finds. And uh, if you want to use this uh, sparse dip, which is the, um, the subspace search part of it, um, so the linear part I'm talking about, the, the full, as the full space clustering technique, if you want the, uh, the sparse dip um, subspace search, that's uh, super linear in n, it's n log n, I think it is from memory. and. Uh, m squared or something, m being the dimensionality of the data set. Uh, so uh, that is nonlinear, correct? Yeah. Thank you. Um, thanks for the very interesting uh, talk and the great presentation, actually. So um, you may have mentioned this when you said, talked about the limitations of how it cannot find rounded things. So have you thought about kernel extensions and stuff like that? Yeah, so there could definitely be extensions to this to, to help overcome that limitation. Uh, one way is that you might want to sort of rotate it little bits and sort of cut out the edges uh, right. 
but there, there could be, I guess, various ways you could, uh, you could perhaps take the, the center of the, the square that it's found and then from that, on, that point on start a density-based technique or something. Uh, the, the, I mean, you can probably imagine a few different uh, heuristics you could do from So that. do you think it could be um, easily extensible to spectral kind of approaches to um, find clusters within clusters or something like that? Yeah, uh, so that's a good question. Uh, so if you have a cluster within a cluster, say a Gaussian within a larger Gaussian, uh, the dip will find that as essentially one mode. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that's not something we've tested a lot with. Uh, it would require a bit more uh, experimentation, but my gut feeling says that it would run into problems on that kind of situation. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I have a question about, uh, you mentioned that it's non-parametric. Um, um, how does the algorithm decide where to stop in finding uh, peaks? Um, yeah, great question. Uh, so the dip test is this binary hypothesis test, right? Uh, it gives us, it either, will either say it's unimodal or multimodal. But it's not just that, it gives us also the, the, multi, the modal interval as a product of the calculation and that allows us to, to turn it into a clustering technique. And we stop essentially when, when it gives us a unimodal result. Oh, so at we, each dimension. Yeah, uh, so uh, I think I showed it in one of the slides uh, where the recursion stopped because it found the second mode for us, which it says that's unimodal, here's the mode you were looking for, and that's it. That's, that's essentially how it works. If it were multimodal, we'd know we'd have to keep recursing to the left or the right <laughs> to find the next one. Cool. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, the power of the clustering technique would depend on the power of the statistical test. So if you're missing a cluster, it's because the test doesn't find a multimodal distribution. Um, are there any known distributions where the test that you use fails to find multimodals? Great question. Um, so one of the limitations that I didn't mention in the last slide is that we're quite, uh, it's for continuous numerical data, right? If you look at, for example, a Poisson distribution, which has, uh, you know, this K uh, fixed values of k, maybe 1 to 14 or something like this, the dip will always call that multimodal because it sees it as 14 spikes, essentially. So the dip is uh, essentially only for continuous numerical data. Uh, so that's one example of a distribution where it won't work. You look at other, if you have, for example, a snake cluster where perhaps a density or a spectral-based technique might work better, uh, that we typically run into problems with that as well because in all the dimensions it might not be a nice modal form. All right, thank you. We got time for another one? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for giving me an algorithm I might actually use for clustering. Um, and someone stole my question, so I'm going to ask another one. Um, so uh, the sparse uh, dipping. Yeah. Uh, so there are like so things like even linear discriminant analysis that tries to like give a projection that gives you the maximal separating mm -hmm. mo separating the maximum modes and so on. Yeah. So is there some deep connection there? Like is this the do you find for example, do you often find the same hyperplane perhaps or like what I mean you're trying to maximize the dip score, but yeah. is it the same as maximizing the uh, separation between Gaussian peaks, perhaps, or yeah, uh, that's a good question. Uh, so, we, I guess we tried to be consistent in our approach. We we, we based everything on the dip essentially, uh, so we didn't look at too many alternatives. But that doesn't mean that uh, an alternative approach to finding a subspace uh, in this way and then plugging that into skinny dip uh, would also be an interesting experiment. I just wonder whether, like, perhaps it covers the same things, so maybe there's some connection in there. Yeah, so uh, you can have many modes that are quite close together and that will give a lower dip score than if you have two modes that are quite far apart. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm not quite sure. I mean, we'd, you'd have to look into whether or not the dip is a direct replacement for some of, the, you know, some of these other things you'd look into. All right, into. thank you. I'm talking about connections, the, the hyper intervals, as you yeah. call them, remind me of decision trees. Yeah. Uh, and um, and um, how, I mean, one of the cases that, that I remember um, where decision trees fails is, is that trying to classify an oval or an ellipse, right? The inside mm -hmm. of the ellipse versus the outside of the ellipse. And you had a reference to problems with rounded clusters, I think yeah. is the language that you use. Yeah. And so in the case of decision trees, we invented um, 
ensembles. And so what would an ensemble of deep clusters look like? Good question. Uh, so I think uh, uh, it's sort of related to one of the questions before. Um, to, to overcome this problem of the sort of square um, right angled edges, these hyper rectangles, you could come up with various heuristics uh, to perhaps improve on that. Uh, maybe an ensemble of uh, approaching it from different perspectives, different angles might give you a refined idea of where the clusters are. Uh, this is not something we looked at in our work. Uh, we leave it, I guess, the, to the community to build on our work, uh, maybe look into additional options for, for overcoming that limitation. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much once more.